All right, I think all the electronics are now working. <laughs> Speaking of all the electronics working, we were uh, about an hour into our day today when Megan, sitting at her laptop, came to me and said, Dad, do we have Bell South or AT&T? And I said, yeah. And she said, when I turn the computer on, I'm getting a notice saying AT&T can't connect. And I said, well, let me give it a look. And I went and checked my computer, and sure enough, same notice. And, and I picked up the home phone, because it's all part of the same system, nothing happening. Okay, okay. So I go look at the router, and the router's flashing red. So, okay, we, we have no internet, we have no phone. We were in the dark ages! <laughs> I used my cell phone, fortunately I had a cell phone, used the cell phone to call AT&T and get a recording saying, there is an outage in your area. <laughs> like, please don't bother us. In fact, the end of the recording even said, customer service representatives have no more information. Like, so that you don't go get me an operator. What is wrong? And so we had no internet for like three hours. It must have been awful. It was awful. I don't know how I survived it. Uh, it just, it was horrible. And uh, we, we were in the dark ages for a while, and Renee called during that period, and I said, I, I have no internet. And she said, how are you getting along? I don't, what are you doing? I said, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm making notes for tonight, and, and I'm making them with ink on paper, the way I used to. I'm reading books that are actually printed on paper. I'm, I'm referencing books that are actually substantial physical books. I, I don't know how I do it. <laughs> so anyway, eventually it came back on and we were like, woohoo, 21st century. And now we're caught back up. Tonight, we're continuing to talk about pneumatology. This is the third week of our pneumatology series. And we really spent a substantial part of the first two weeks talking about the Trinity, which was really part of defining who the Holy Spirit is as part of the Trinity and as being holy. And so we're going to talk tonight and probably next week about the operation of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. This helps us get a greater sense of who the Holy Spirit is, and the Holy Spirit's participation in the triune Godhead. I have an old pastor friend who frequently will use the phrase, the Bible is a hymn book. And what he means by it is H-I-M. Oh. <laughs> oh, did that leave you wondering? <laughs> and, and what he would say is, you know, the Bible all ultimately leads you to him. It's all about him, so it's a hymn book. And that's true. You know, if you're reading the Bible and you're not seeing Christ, you're not reading it clearly yet. You need to make sure as you read through the Bible that you see the predictions of Christ coming and then Christ's ministry and the predictions of him coming back. It really is, in so many ways, a hymn book. But as I have continued looking into the topic of pneumatology and have continued looking into the activity of the Holy Spirit, it is profound how the Holy Spirit functions, operates, participates, and is present in truly everything that God does, which only makes sense because, after all, God is a spirit. And when we say things like God is everywhere, he's omnipresent, what we mean is by his spirit he's everywhere. Well, there's that participation of the spirit thing. When we say that he can hear everybody's prayer all at once. Well, that's because by his Holy Spirit, he is able to, to listen and to help us with our groanings and take our prayers to God. And, and as I continued going through the Bible, trying to find good examples of the work of the Holy Spirit, I realized that I would really just kind of have to read the Bible from front to back if I was going to be in any way exhaustive on the topic. Because whether you're talking about the Spirit of God hovering over the, 
the deep when the, worth, when the earth was without form and was void. So there's the spirit of God at work. Whether you're talking about the spirit of God speaking through the prophets of God, or whether you're talking about the spirit of God empowering the judges, whether you're talking about the spirit of God working behind the scenes to providentially bring about the things that he had established, whether you're talking about the spirit of God appearing in the form of a dove and anointing Jesus at his baptism, or whether you're talking about the Holy Spirit inspiring the New Testament writers and bringing to their memory everything that Jesus had said to them, whether you're talking about the Holy Spirit sealing those that belong to God or the promises via the Holy Spirit that God has made to his church and the prophetic promises that permeate the New Testament or whether you're talking about New Jerusalem. Everywhere you look in the Bible, the Holy Spirit really is right there. The same way that Jesus is front and center throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit is right there in operation constantly throughout the Bible. So really, though we're going to spend the next couple of weeks looking at characteristics, behaviors, work of the Holy Spirit, I have to tell you that we're just barely scratching the surface of the topic. And you're going to see a broad array of different aspects of the operation of God where the Holy Spirit is the primary worker. We're going to read a little bit from Charles Ryrie. We're going to talk a little A.W. Pink. We're going to talk a little bit of uh, Wayne Grudem tonight. And we're going to do a whole lot of Bible. So... Let's start with the person of the Holy Spirit. And I'm really going to let Ryrie do this work for us because he has a chapter in his systematic theology on the section on the Holy Spirit or in the section on the Holy Spirit. He has a section that is dedicated to the person of the Holy Spirit. And you know the last couple of weeks as we have talked about the Trinity, the way that I have defined the Trinity is three persons, one God. But what Ryrie points out is that he has all of the characteristics of genuine personhood and personality. That he is not just a force. Sometimes when we speak of the spirit of God accomplishing things, what people hear when we say that is, well, that is some kind of force or power of God that is going out from God and doing things. But Ryrie argues that it is someone who is doing those things. And so the Holy Spirit is a person. For instance, Ryrie writes this. Many people have labeled the 20th century as the century of the Holy Spirit. The rise and spread of Pentecostalism with its major emphasis, oh, with its major emphasis, too many sissuses I had going, with its major emphasis on the ministries of the Spirit and the blossoming. All right, good night, folks. <laughs> Thanks for being here, because I was going to read quite a bit tonight, and if I can't read, let's just all go home. I'll slow down. The rise and spread of Pentecostalism, with its major emphasis on the ministries of the Spirit and the blossoming of dispensationalism's emphasis on the work of the Spirit, are distinctive to this age. To the century's concern for the evangelization of the world, it highlighted a need to know the power of the Spirit to accomplish this. Though this attention on the work of the Spirit has been a good thing, it has not always been scripturally guided. Thus, there exists an even greater need today to be careful and pay scrupulous attention to the biblical teaching on this topic. And that is certainly true. You know, the Holy Spirit is mischaracterized oftentimes when there is an overemphasis on the Holy Spirit to the subjugation of Christ or to God himself. This is something that you see a lot in Pentecostalism. And if you want to see an example of what I'm talking about, you can turn on TBN just about any time of day and you will see people speaking of and for the Holy Spirit in a way that is truly unbiblical. He is a person. 
Denial that the spirit is a person often takes the form of substituting the concept that he is a personification of, say, power, much like claiming that Satan is a personification of evil. This denial of his personality has occurred throughout church history, first by the Monarchians, then the Arians, then the Socinians, and today by Unitarians, liberals, and some neo-Orthodox theologians. Under the heading A, he says, the spirit possesses and exhibits the attributes of a person. Tom, turn to 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. Carol, turn to Romans 8, 28. Somebody else want to look something up? Gladys back there, look up 1 Corinthians 2, 13 for us. Actually, Tom's looking up 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11, so he's kind of there, but... So you look up Ephesians 4.30 for us, and we'll let Tom take care of the 1 Corinthians stuff. The first characteristic that the Holy Spirit exhibits that shows that he has personhood is that he has an intelligence. In other words, he is not just an ambiguous force. He knows and he searches the things of God. And that requires intelligence, as Tom is now going to read for us from 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. Start at 10 and read till 13. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual thoughts to those who are spiritual. So here you have the Spirit of God interpreting spiritual thoughts to people who are spiritual and understanding the mind of God and then interpreting that and bringing it to us. Okay, well, that's an active intelligence. I'm sorry? Putting it into words for us. Yeah, putting it into words and putting it into comprehension for us. I mean, really, which of us would be able to comprehend it if God said, let me explain the universe. You got a minute? I mean, we would, we'd be lost. Let me tell you how, uh, how I've balanced the galaxies. You know? I have an equation. Let me show you. you know? we, we would just be completely befuddled. And so when God thinks about or, to, or wants to communicate eternal important things to human beings, it is the Spirit of God who understands the mind of God who brings these spiritual things to spiritual people. Well, that's intelligence, and that's communication, and that's comprehension, and that's proof that the Holy Spirit is a person. You're going to read Romans 8, 27 for us, Carol, which says that the Holy Spirit possesses a mind. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of, of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Can I read that again? Please? Sure you can. And he that searches the hearts know what is, what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Isn't that something? Yeah, and he knows the mind of the Spirit. So that's a consciousness. That's a thoughtfulness. So then he is able, as First as Corinthians 2.13 said, the end of what Tom read for us, he's able then to teach people. Not only does he have a mind where he comprehends the deep thoughts of God, but he is able to interpret those things and teach people. Well, if he's a teacher and a communicator, then that's wisdom, that's mind, that's communication, that's intelligence, that's personhood. He shows feelings. He can be grieved by the sinful actions of believers, and a mere influence can't be grieved. He has to have personality, feelings, thoughts, 
in order to be grieved. And that is exactly what I believe we have Gladys looking up for us in Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed from the day of redemption. We'll get into the sealing in a little bit. But not only have we been sealed with the Spirit, showing that we have been uh, made safe, we have been protected by God, by the habitation of his spirit, so that we are eternally secure. And since that spirit is in us and sealing us, he goes where we go. He participates in what we do. And so Paul would even argue that you should not join your body to a prostitute. Because in so doing, you're dragging the holy, never underplay the fact that the adjective that describes the spirit, is that it is the holy spirit of God who you're dragging into your sinfulness and your muck and your mire. You know, if you're outraged and angry and flying off, you're dragging the spirit of God, the holy spirit of God through that with you. And I think those are examples of how it is that you can grieve the spirit because the spirit isn't like that. Have you ever been in a social circumstance where you hear something about yourself or you're in the middle of, of some occurrence that's happening and you say to yourself, I can't be any part of this. I'm not like that. I had a conversation with somebody today who said, you know, I used to go out and party and drink and smoke dope and... You know, and now I can't hang out with my old friends anymore because I go there. That's all they want to do. All they want to do is drink and smoke dope and parties. And I can't do that anymore. I don't even want to do that anymore. God has taken the desire away from me. And it's hard for me to explain to them, that's not like me. It makes me sick. It makes me sick. I'm not like that. Okay. Okay. 24 hours a day, you have the Holy Spirit of God inside you who's not like that. And yet we insist on dragging him with us into all of our very human, very ugly, sinful, depraved stuff. And you can grieve him. So the point being, if he can be grieved, he's a person. You can't grieve a force. He has a will. Are you still over in 1 Corinthians? Yes. You're in 1 Corinthians 11? I'm going to have you read that one more time because he uses his will. Go to 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Is that what I just said? 12, 11. This is in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which we're going to look at in more depth in a few moments. But it is by the will of the Spirit that there is a distribution of the charismata, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so the distribution of the gifts within the body of Christ is up to the Holy Spirit, which means that he has a will and a decision-making ability. That's personhood. Read 1 Corinthians 12, 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So he apportions the gifts, the charismata, to whomever he chooses to give them to, according to his will. And according to what the needs are there. Please. Sure, whatever the needs are within the body. But the point for the time being is, and we'll get into those charismata perhaps tonight, perhaps next week, but the point for the time being is that's personality. If he has a will, if he has intelligence, if he can be grieved, this is personality. He exhibits the actions of a person. Since genuine personality possesses intelligence, feeling, and will, and since the spirit has all these attributes, he must be a person. And he exhibits the actions of a person. Number one, he guides us into truth by hearing, speaking, and showing the truth. We looked at this last week. In John 16, Jesus said to his apostles that the spirit, whom he called the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, was going to remind them of everything that he had said and was going to take from the things that belong to the Father and the Son and show them to the apostles. He also convicts us of sin. That's John 16, 8. 
if he has the ability to convict us of sin, then he recognizes when we're being sinful, that's intelligence, and then he is able to convict us of our sinfulness. When people ask me, as they so often do, how do I know that I'm saved? I always say the proof positive of salvation is that you have the Spirit of God inhabiting you. And they say, well, then how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? And I say, how do you feel about your sin? Because if you don't have the Spirit of God, you don't care about your sin. You're happy in your sin. Even Paul admits that there's this pleasure in sin for a season. But uh, the, the depraved man, the unregenerate man, doesn't know that he's in sin, doesn't care that he's in sin, has no thought about his rebellion against God. And if the subject ever does come up, he just shakes his fist and says, I don't care. So if you start to worry about your sin, if you think about the fact that God might be a righteous and a holy judge and that you might not fare well under his judgment, this is proof that the Holy Spirit is dealing with you and convicting you of your sin. <clears throat> uh, Acts 8.39 tells us that the Holy Spirit performs miracles. Somebody look that up. Look up Acts 39 and read it to us. Acts 8.39. Because we think of God performing miracles, and certainly in the Old Testament we see that. We think of Jesus performing miracles, certainly enough. But the apostles performed their miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 8.39. Somebody, oh, Marilyn's got her hand up. Yes. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took So this is after Philip had baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. And then the Spirit of God caught Philip away. Quite miraculous. And by the way, not unlike the way the Spirit of God in the Old Testament would catch Ezekiel away. Would just snatch him up and drop him somewhere. In fact, at one point, Ezekiel writes, he picked me up by my hair and took me off and showed me what was going on in Jerusalem and all the evil that was happening. Acts physically. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that can't happen to me, really. I just, uh, <laughs> it was the spirit of God. Just go ahead, make your own joke, enjoy it, go ahead. The spirit of God took Ezekiel and put him in a valley of dry bones. You read that in Ezekiel 37. So it is the spirit of God that performs really mighty miracles. And of course, Romans 8.26 says that he intercedes for us. Now this, of course, goes... Somebody look that up quick. Romans 8.26. This goes along with his intelligence and his interpretive ability to understand the mind of God and then interpret the mind of God to us who are spiritual. And all that means is those of us who have the Spirit of God Right along with that, he intercedes for us because we don't have the ability to speak to God and pray to God the way that we really ought to. And sometimes we're reduced to just noises, groaning, and grunting. Sometimes you just fall on your face in front of God and say, I don't know, I don't know. Well, that's good to know that the Spirit of God who is interpreting God for you is carrying you back to God as well. Interpreting your groanings. Interpreting your groaning. So read it, Romans 8, 26. In, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Groanings too deep for words. Because we don't know how to pray as we ought. Yeah. I remember, I know I've quoted this before, but I remember many years ago a preacher saying, the best prayer I ever prayed had enough sin in it to put me in hell forever. And that's right. Because after all, even our best prayers are still prayers that are coming from sinful minds, sinful hearts. Have you ever been in the middle of a prayer and, and you're praying, and you're sincere, and you're genuine, and some 
creepy thought will leap into your head and distract you and suddenly you're thinking about something else or because that's just our natural human proclivity. I can't wait to shed this mortal coil and stand before God and be able to worship him the way he deserves to be worshiped and speak to him and praise him and pray to him without all of this sinful physicality that is just part of me. I've been in the middle of prayer before and had my body hurt or suddenly be overwhelmed with hunger or just fall asleep because we're just so human. So we don't know how to pray as we ought, but fortunately for us, God understood that contingency and made sure that the spirit is there not only to interpret him to us, but to interpret us back to him, which is very good news. These are activities which an influence or a personification could not do, but which scripture shows the Holy Spirit can do. He receives ascriptions, names, descriptions of himself, which can only be given to a person. Like in Acts 10, 19 to 21, we read that he is one who is to be obeyed. Okay, well, you can only say that of a person because you only obey somebody who has the intelligence to know how to command and direct and lead. In Acts 5, 3, we find out that he's one who can be lied to. You know, that's when... Uh, Yes, to great consequences. That's when the husband and wife team said that they had sold some land and, and uh, came and told Peter. And Peter said, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? And yeah, the consequences were they dropped dead. And they lied separately, one after another. And Peter said, who has moved on you to do this and lie to the Holy Spirit? And they died over it. Okay, well again... That's a, an ascription of a person. If you can lie to him, then there's a morality to him. There's a consciousness to him if you can lie to him. He can also be resisted, according to Acts 7.51. He can be grieved, as we already read from Ephesians 4.30. Matthew 12.31, that's the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which we're going to look into a little deeper coming up. Uh, if he can be blasphemed, then he has personality. He can be insulted, according to Hebrews 10.29. Somebody look that up. Let's have a look at that. Hebrews 10.29. Because it is a sobering phrase to think of acting and reacting to a mere influence in these ways, obeying or lying or resisting or grieving, blaspheming, insulting. If, if that's just a, an influence or a force, then these descriptions of him are completely incongruous. Who's got Hebrews 10.29? Got it, Tom? Yeah. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace. I think the King James says insulted the spirit of grace. So you can, you can outrage and insult the spirit. That proves personhood. And then he also relates to other people the way that a person would. For instance, in dealing with the apostles, Acts 15.28 is a good example he relates to the apostles in a manner that shows his own distinct personality. He is a person as they are persons, and yet he is distinct and identifiable as a separate person. Someone look up, Acts 15, 28. In fact, Tom, look that up. Carol, look up John 16, 14. Gladys, look up Matthew 28, 19. Uh, Robert, why don't you look up Luke 4.14 for us, please. Marilyn, Acts 10.38. James, you're going to have to move up. We can't hear you all the way back there. Don't care. Give me the verse. <laughs> <laughs> Acts 10.38. Give me the verse. 
Did I already give, no, did I give Maryland Acts 10.38? Yeah. Okay, 1 Corinthians 2.4. We'll work our way through all of these. Acts 15.28 says what, Tom? For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. Isn't that interesting? That once James dealt with Paul and, and his companions and Peter arguing that the Holy Spirit had come to Gentiles, they then said, well, okay, then just tell them not to eat anything from blood and uh, you know, don't worship idols. And it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit not to lay anything greater than that. Who's there with them, but is a distinct personality. It seems good to us and it seems good to him. So that is a distinct, identifiable person. In relating to Jesus, he relates to our Lord in such a way that if the Lord has personality, one must conclude that the Spirit also has personality. Yet he is distinct from Christ. This is John 16, 14. It'll sound familiar. Carol? He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Mm -hmm. In other words, Jesus is talking about the unity between him and the Father and then between him and the Spirit. And the argument that Ryrie makes here is if Jesus has personality and then he likens himself to the Spirit in such a way that there is unity between them, then the Spirit must have personality because he's going to take what is mine and show it to you. And so that shows again that he relates to, interacts with, other people. He relates to the other persons of the Trinity as an equal person. Did I give someone Matthew twenty-eight nineteen? Yes. Okay, Gladys. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So there's relationship with the Father and the Son. We have to argue that the Father and the Son have personality and are distinct from each other. Therefore, since he is equated with the other two, we would have to say that he has the same characteristics. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, did I give that to anybody? No, I skipped over that. So Tom, look that up and we'll get back to it. He relates to his own power. The spirit is related to his own power, and yet he is distinguished from it so that we may not conclude that he is merely a personification of power. Luke 4.14 says, Robert? And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a thing of him throughout all the region round about. Now this is after he had been baptized. It's a real interesting series of events. He's baptized. The Spirit of God comes down in the form of a dove. The Father speaks from heaven, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. There you have the Trinity. Jesus in the water, being baptized. The Holy Spirit is a dove. The voice from heaven is the Father. So you have the Trinity. The very next thing that you read, and all four of the Gospels include this, that he was baptized, and then immediately he was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Then after his 40 days in the wilderness... After 40 days of fasting and after the temptations, finally Satan leaves, waiting for a more opportune time. And then Luke records for us that he went into Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And so he was anointed with the Spirit at his baptism. He was led by the Spirit to be tempted of the devil. And then he went in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. He had need yeah, he needs some power. Of course, we also read at the end of that that the angels came and ministered to him. I would like to think that someone brought something to eat. <laughs> something, a cupcake, something. And so, so yes, but I understand what Gladys is saying, is after 40 days of not eating, if he got up and went into Galilee, he would have to have the power of the Spirit to enable him to even do that in his weakened state. So I don't mean to make light of it. It's a very good point that you make. And so... Yeah, spiritual food, no doubt. Miracle food, they gave him. Yeah. So 
All of that, again, shows him, the Holy Spirit, interacting with Christ, even though we read that he's in unity with Christ, and even though Carol read that he'll take what is mine and show it to you, so there's this unity, and yet you see clear distinction that it was the Spirit that led Christ. It was the Spirit that empowered Christ. It was the Spirit that anointed Christ. So they are separate personalities, and yet unity within the Godhead. Now, is this mysterious? Oh, yes, absolutely. But we have to just say, but this is what the Bible tells us. Quite a mystery. And I think if he actually explained it to us, our heads would explode anyway. So. Acts 10.38, Marilyn? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth and the Holy Spirit and power, with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Yeah. Isn't that an interesting verse? Because it's Jesus going about doing the great works, but he's doing it in the power, the dunamis of the Holy Spirit, and he's doing it for God. So the Trinity is, is right there operational in that verse. Yeah, it's certainly evident that relationships are a source of great strength because even God himself had made that plan and had developed that relationship because that was helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is strength in relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe, James, you have 1 Corinthians 2.4. Okay. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human, wis human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, and that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So again, here you see the, the relationship, the way that the spirit relates to people, and he does it through power. So all of these things put together can be summarized in a grammatical consideration that Ryrie writes. Several times the writers of the New Testament will use a masculine pronoun to refer to the spirit, even though the word spirit is a neuter. The clearest example of this exception to normal grammatical usage is John 16, 13, and 14, where the masculine demonstrative pronoun is used twice to refer to the spirit mentioned in verse 13. Other references are less clear since the masculine pronouns used may refer to the word the parakletos or the paraclete, which is masculine in 1526 and 16, 7, and 8, or to the word earnest, which is also masculine in Ephesians 1, 14, and 15. Nevertheless, the clear exception to normal accidents in John 16, 13, and 14 does support the true personality of the Spirit. Each of these lines of scriptural evidence leads to the conclusion that the Holy Spirit, even though a spiritual being, is a real person as real as the Father or the Son or even as we. So I enjoyed that bit from Ryrie's systematic theology where he explains, and I think gave us adequate evidence, that the Holy Spirit is not just a force, but is in fact a person with personality, with thinking, with ability, with communication, with interaction. And therefore, we need to think of him as a person. Because the word spirit, as he pointed out, is, is technically a neuter word, he is given the proper masculine pronoun usually, and I even in years past, and I hear it sometimes on recordings, and I'll catch it and it makes me jump, I'll speak of the Holy Spirit and say it. Because spirit, and the same way that the Father has a name, Yahweh, and the same way that Jesus is a name for the Son, the Holy Spirit's just the Holy Spirit. And so sometimes it's easy to think of the Holy Spirit as it. But the biblical writers even took the time to change basic Greek pronoun usage in order to give male attribute to a neuter word. And that's important because they recognized the personality of the Holy Spirit. He is not it. He is he. Make sense? A.W. Pink. Let's talk about A.W. Pink for just a moment. 
wrote a series of 28-page booklets called Studies in Scriptures, and he really wrote them for most of his ministerial life from 1932 till 1953. And then they were mailed out to anybody who wrote and said, please send me it. And every month he would send these things out. And then a lot of those booklets were combined into what are now some of the books by Pink. In the early days of his writing the studies in scriptures from 1932 to 1937, over that five-year period, he wrote a number of articles concerning the Holy Spirit. They were compiled into a book called The Holy Spirit, that is available as a free PDF download. And uh, for the folks watching this, I'll, I'll just throw a link up there with the YouTube video or on Facebook for anybody who wants it. I'll, I'll throw a link on my blog too when I put the notes up for anybody who wants to download the free PDF. I have it and it's, it's a good read. It's a long read, but it's a good read if you really want to dig deep into the various attributes of the Holy Spirit. Over the course of five years, Pink thought about what are the attributes and characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And so he devotes several chapters to the work and activity of the Holy Spirit, and I'm just going to tell you some of the chapter headings so that you understand that this is all part and parcel of who the Holy Spirit is. He talks about the Holy Spirit that regenerates. Because after all, when we talk about salvation, it is God that chooses, and it is Christ that died but it's the Holy Spirit that regenerates, that quickens, that brings us from our spiritual deadness to spiritual life. So the Spirit is quickening. The Spirit is enlightening because it is the Spirit that opens our hearts and our minds and our eyes. Jesus spoke all the time of people who had eyes and couldn't see, ears, but they can't hear. He would say, he who has ears, let him hear. What you need the Holy Spirit of God to enlighten you to be able to understand anything about God, which is why you can go through your life knowing nothing, knowing nothing. The lights go on. Everybody's home. The Spirit convicting. We talked about that a few moments ago, that the Spirit of God will convict you of your sinfulness and your need for a Savior. The Spirit comforting. One of his names is the Comforter, the Parakletos, the one that comes alongside. The Spirit drawing. Jeremiah 31, 3, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. Well, the drawing activity by God is done by the Holy Spirit who takes up residence in us, drawing us to God. Then he says, the Spirit working faith. That is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you, not only will he convict you of your need of a Savior and bring about repentance, but he will bring faith. Faith is a gift. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the Spirit of God that produces, that brings about that faith, that gifting of faith. The Spirit uniting to Christ. Though when the Spirit takes up residence in you and draws you, he will unite you to Christ, very much like what Carol read for us earlier, that he will take the things of Christ and show them to us and unite us to Christ. The Spirit indwelling, the Spirit teaching, the Spirit cleansing, the Spirit leading, the Spirit assuring. That's a good one. The Spirit witnessing, the Spirit assisting, the Spirit interceding, the Spirit transforming, the Spirit preserving, the Spirit confirming, the Spirit endowing, the gifts of the Spirit. So let me encourage you, if you want to dig deeper into the topic of who the Holy Spirit is and the way he acts, download the free PDF of the Pink Book and you can look into those. Now, like I said, the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at a lot of this. And we're going to be looking at the activity of the Holy Spirit under some very broad topic headings. For instance, Wayne Grudem says that the work of the Holy Spirit is to make manifest the active presence of God in the world and especially in the church. I like that quote, so I'm going to say it again. The work of the Holy Spirit is to make manifest 
the active presence of God in the world and especially in the church. The very fact that the Holy Spirit of God exists is proof and evidence that God is real. In fact, he is the, the down payment, the earnest of our inheritance. So it's not, just, it's not enough to just be saved and be going to heaven. The work of the Spirit guides our lives here and now. People sometimes ask, why doesn't God just save us and kill us? Because at that moment that we're saved, we're usually doing pretty good. It's like, yay, saved, doing all right. I'm in God, I'm in Jesus, I'm saved, yay, take me now. And then we hang around for a while, sometimes 30, 40, 50 years. And it can be hard. And you can go through dry spells and tough periods. And you can go through times when you think, what is this about? Why didn't you just, if heaven's real and you're up there, God, why would you let me go through this? You were made to be a living stone. Yes, and we are made to be a living testimony to the reality of God by His Spirit here. Build part of the seed. Build. That's right. Part of the tapestry that God is weaving together. He has a purpose for us being here, and so He preserves us in our lifetime by the Spirit, so that even when we're at our worst, we can't get away from the fact that God has called us and chosen us because He's at work guiding our lives from the point of salvation I would argue he's guiding our lives from the point of conception until the point of our ultimate glorification the spirit brings peace the, the Hebrew word shalom I love so much because it means everything in a state of rightness you ever hit that point where you've just kind of looked around and gone it's all good it's all good. And when you know it's all good, you relax. You say, well, whatever else is going on right now, it's okay with me. Everything is ordered. Everything is in harmony. That's the word shalom, great Hebrew word. Well, we get the peace that passes understanding by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit assuring us that it's going to be all right as we go through our trials and troubles. That's why Galatians 5.22 would say that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness and goodness and faithfulness. I mean, think about those things. Think about the fact that the fruit of the Spirit is shalom, is peace. That it is the Spirit of God that makes us know that no matter how crazy the world gets, Ultimately, it's a plan that he's working out, and we're going to be okay. It's the only way you can get it. Yeah, it's the only way you can get it. Yeah, where else are you going to find peace in this crazy world? And it, it flummoxes people. People look at you and go, are you not aware of how nuts it is outside? You say, yeah, but that's okay. God's in control. Well, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit, evidence that he exists. Paul, writing in Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to encourage one another and lift each other up and love each other, sacrifice for each other, and then encourage unity in the spirit, which brings about a bond of peace that, again, the world just doesn't understand, that the world just doesn't know, that the world doesn't experience. James started uh, his summer classes, and he has a college class that's a one-month full semester class in a month. And so he's in school three days a week, five hours a day, and, and he has a month to get physical science out of the way. And then he's also taking an online class, and when he finishes these two classes, he graduates. And so I tell you that to say, he came in tonight, and I said, how's school going? He went, oh man, whoa, just, <laughs> it's so much stuff, and it's just kind of, oh, he said, I need to go to church. <laughs> 
He said, because when I go to church, it's peaceful and it's good and it's quiet and I, and I can listen and I can understand God and I can think about good things. That's that unity in that spirit, that bond of peace that the church is supposed to provide by the Spirit. So let's close with this. Let's look at some verses. Turn to Ephesians 1. We'll start at verses 13 and 14 and talk about the fact that the Spirit of God is God's surety, guarantee, down payment. How do I know that everything else God has said about the future, about Christ, about me, how do I know these things are true? Well, I have a surety. I have a down payment. He just describes me so easily in scripture. Doesn't the scripture just describe us easily? Isn't that something? It describes the world. Yeah, it describes the world accurately, doesn't it? That's the, the biggest proof of the scripture, isn't it? Yeah. They tell you about yourself and the world you're in. Isn't that the truth? That's why I keep saying you can't understand anything about human life or human history or the world if you don't know your Bible. Now think of all those people running the world and they don't. And they don't know. Our elected officials. Yes, indeed. Okay, so um, most of us in here have at some time purchased uh, real estate of some type. When you, If you're going to buy a house, sometimes it even happens when you're going to buy a car. Uh, I've had it happen before buying musical instruments where I'll say, oh, in fact, I'll give you a better example. I, I have a new kitten. <laughs> the way I got the kitten, we were at the pet store, and, uh, and I, okay, I fell in love. And I, we've been looking for months, ever since dude died, we've been looking for a kitten, and I'm very persnickety about cats, and so I've been waiting to find one with a good personality, looking for the right cat. And then I finally found her. So, okay, that's the one. That's who I'm looking for. And the pet store said, if you feel pretty confident that that's the one you want, you can put a down payment on her. And basically, they said uh, it's a non-refundable down payment, but the cat is $95. If you put $20 down, we'll let you make up your mind. We won't sell her to anybody else till you make up your mind. Okay, well, that's a surety. That's what that is. If you're going to buy a house and you're serious and you make an offer, you usually put some earnest money down. And it means exactly that. That's why it's called earnest money. It means I'm earnest about buying your house. I'm serious enough about it that I'm willing to put some money down. Okay, well, the New Testament writers use that language to say that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. It's the down payment of everything else that's coming. It's hard for me to imagine heaven. It's even harder for me to imagine me in heaven. <laughs> Heaven's a tough concept. I read it and go, sounds good. New Jerusalem, can't fathom it. How do I know it's real? Well, I have the down payment. And I have evidence of the down payment because the Holy Spirit changed me dramatically, radically, in ways that I couldn't have changed me and wouldn't have changed me. And I'm much too rebellious to be this way. So I have evidence that somebody external to me who became internal to me changed me from within, changed the way I think and changed my priorities and changed my desires and changed my wants and my likes and my preferences and, and drew me to the word of God in a way that I can't explain and has given me a mind and a comprehension for the word of God that I just didn't have before. I could read the Bible and just not get it, not understand it. And, and then the lights went on and I get it and I understand it. Okay, I have evidence of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the down payment on the heaven and the new Jerusalem that I don't understand yet. But I know it's there and I know it's real and I know Christ is coming back and I know he's coming for his church and I know all that because the earnest payment has already been made. Get the picture? Well, that's the language Paul uses. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him 
with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a, the NASB says, as a pledge, the King James says, as an earnest of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. In other words, there's going to be this redemption of God's possession, his church, his people. He's going to bring them all to him and they're going to see his glory and they're going to stand in his presence. And with a view to that, he put the down payment down, which is the earnest of our inheritance which is the Holy Spirit of God with which we are sealed. Your legal right to that. If you put earnest money down, nobody <clears throat> else can buy it. Nobody else can buy it. We've been nobody bought. Nobody else can get it. We've yeah. been bought. Isn't that what Peter wrote? You've been bought with a price. Hmm. And so we've already been purchased. We've already been bought. The, the down payment's made. And by the way, since he's really faithful, I expect that if he's already deposited the earnest and has already killed his son and raised him up again and seated him at his right hand, I figure he's going to pay up. I figure it's all going to work out okay. He opens the door, it can't be closed. Absolutely. He opens the door, it can't be open. Oh, absolutely. If he opens it, it can't be closed. If he closes it, it can't be open. Turn to 2 Corinthians. We're going to look at the exact same thing. 2 Corinthians right in chapter 1. And then we'll go to chapter 5. Because Paul uses this language over and over again. Second Corinthians 1, look at verse 21. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 1, 21. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge as a down payment as an earnest a guarantee. as a guarantee go to chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians we'll read the first five verses for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house. He's talking about our bodies. For we know that if it is torn down, which is going to be, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Okay, so your body is going to get old and decay and get sick and die. But God has a new body waiting for you. God's going to give you a new and an eternal body. How do we know that this is going to happen? Well, he's already given us the down payment, is what Paul's about to say. For indeed, in this house, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> yep. Man, this old tired body, and then I read about no more sickness, no more death, no more crying. God wipes away every tear. Yes, please. Bring that on. Where do I sign up for that? Let's do that. Let's do that now. Please, let's bring that. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed. So that, so that what is mortal, our, our physical mortal bodies, will be swallowed up by life. Oh, such great language. So he's saying that when your body dies, then your spirit is just separated from your body and he likened that to being naked and so you want to be clothed again which you will be by God with an eternal body and so then when that happens what is mortal gets swallowed up in life now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave to us the spirit as a pledge as a guarantee as an earnest payment, that all the rest of it is true. 
See, I'm looking forward to that new body thing. I'm looking forward to my heavenly destiny. And I know that it's true, says Paul, because he's already given us the pledge. And if God, who is faithful, gives you the pledge, he's going to give you what is promised by that pledge. So next week, we'll start by looking at he purifies. I mean, after all, he is the Holy Spirit. And then that he reveals, teaches, and guides and then uh, gives evidence of God's presence. I think that'll probably be enough for one week. We'll look at all that next week. And we will continue to dig into the topic of pneumatology. And, and as I said, the more we dig, the more we're going to find that the Holy Spirit is intimately involved in all the activity of God. And uh, it's really quite amazing. Every page of the Bible, you look deep enough, you see the Spirit of God at work right there. Has he ever been told to do something that he do? Say that again. Has he ever been told to do something that he do? Not that I can find. He does it all. He sometimes does some pretty tricky things, but, but he always does what he is sent to do. Isn't that what we read on Sunday? You know, God said that he sends his word and it won't return to him void. It will accomplish that whereunto I've sent it. Same thing with the Spirit. If God sends... It's the Spirit that does that. Exactly. And if the Spirit of God has been sent by God to accomplish something, and if it is the Spirit of the Almighty God, it is the Spirit of the Sovereign, what are the chances that the Holy Spirit will not accomplish everything that he is desiring to accomplish or that he's been sent to accomplish? If he decides that he's going to do it, and it starts with... We all want a little guarantee to see a little of that. We all want to guarantee. There was an article in today's paper, I think, this guy said he had just really gotten into into, into uh, religion, into God, into Christ in the last few years that he's really been studying. But said he was getting ready to have surgery, and he thought, well, God said, I really would like some evidence of your presence, some way to just really assure me. And so he kept going on, and he said he started calling people that he knew. And he said there was one person he wanted to call him, but he hadn't talked to him in a good while. So he, he didn't do it. He kept putting it off. Finally, he went on and had the surgery. And he was, as he was coming out of surgery, waking up, his wife was coming in through the door. She had his telephone. And it rang. And it was this friend that he hadn't called. And the friend said, God just let me, he didn't know the friend, no, he had a surgery. The friend, just, God just tickled me to call you and find out how you're doing. And here was the answer to his prayer. And so those, those little non-conspicuous things are so so, <laughs> so sure. You know, one of my favorite phrases is, providence works. People come to me and they tell me stories and say, I can't believe what happened. I needed something and it showed up at my door. Or I just can't believe, I, you know, I looked up right at the moment that the train was crying. I would have been killed. I would have. And my answer is always, providence works. And the only reason providence works is because the Holy Spirit of God is active out there protecting and taking care of and preserving and, and educating God's people. That man so. was brave enough to put it in the paper for everybody to read. Isn't that something? Right. Yeah. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Given what we've studied tonight, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the down payment, the pledge, the promise that you have made. And as we look into your word, it is by your spirit that we're able to understand what we're reading. And it is by your spirit that we have hope and that we have peace, and that we're able to look forward to the future and not be afraid. It is by your Spirit that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, crying, Abba, Father. So we thank you for this incalculable gift that you have given us. Thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for your continuous faithfulness to this little church here in Smyrna. You've been so very good to us. We thank you for the people that you gather here. 
in the way that you bless us all. We thank you that you did not leave us to ourselves, but that you gave us your word and you gave us your spirit and you gave us these precious promises that we are standing on. So we thank you. We pray that you will take care of everybody as they head toward their homes, keep them safe on the highways, get them safely into their beds, give us all a good night's rest. Help us as we go through our days to do good things, to have confidence in you, and uh, to be pleasing to you. We thank you for all these things in Christ Jesus' glorious and matchless name. Amen.